Well, thanks for the uh, free economic lesson, Gary. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, hey, just one more question. Um, I don't know quite how to phrase this, but I am so sick of the infighting I have witnessed over the years. What do you think is causing this? Well, the other day we were kind of talking about that, and I think you put a different, attached a different phrase to it, uh, trial by press. Is that what you mean? We're... Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, the result often is infighting, but it's trial by press. Now, trial by press assumes a trial, and so we'll start there first. And uh, let's, let's take uh, O.J. Simpson. Most people believe that he was guilty. However, the jury didn't think he was guilty. Uh, the press painted a picture. They showed the, 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 the great low-speed chase. They showed his attorney walking out with a suitcase, and nobody could even mention the suitcase in court, wondering if blood and clothes were in it or not. Uh, but we got a picture. We got the glove over and over and over again. Uh, so the the viewer, the, the the naive person who really, their only picture into what's happening is what comes on the press, hence trial by press. Uh, let's look at that uh what was that girl's name in Florida that was uh, supposed to have murdered her child, and she was acquitted? Oh, uh, was it? Are you referring to Andrea Yates? No, I don't think that was her name. I think it was Andrea something, but it might have been. Mm. Anyway, she was. You know, there was. The, they went out in the woods looking for the kid, and all over. Now she was acquitted by a jury, like Simpson, uh, who had all the evidence laid out before them. But the the press was uh, for the during the whole trial laid her out as guilty, and so when she was acquitted, the patriot community, in fact, the entire country, seemed to be outraged that she was acquitted because she must have killed this kid because that's the picture we got through the press. Um, let's go to a more recent one: this uh, Arias girl, the one that stabbed her boyfriend and shot him and took pictures. This will give you an idea how the press works. I was watching it, I think it was this morning, maybe it was yesterday morning when I was eating breakfast, I was watching the news, and the reporter comes on and she says, Arias is trying to convince the jury that she was abused. She didn't say that Arias testified that she'd been abused. She said, trying to convince the jury. But isn't that just a defense that every defendant is uh, supposed to do so they can try and not get punished by the government? Back up. You're, you're missing something there. Do you know what subliminal advertising is? Oh, uh, yeah. Subliminal advertising is graphic. You know, they flash Coca-Cola for one or two frames on a movie screen, and, oh, Coca-Cola, I'm thirsty. I think I'll go get one. Or... Uh, I think a friend of mine years ago was uh, taking a class in psychology, and she did a thing on subliminal advertising, and she had a, I think it was Jim Beam, they had a glass with the, uh, uh, the sweat going down the sides and everything, and if you look real closely, you could see an outline of a naked girl, breasts and, and hips on it. Uh, that's subliminal advertising. Now, we tend to think of subliminal advertising as uh, visual. But is it audio? She's trying to convince the jury implies that she's lying. Doesn't it? Yeah. But she testified to the jury that is objective. That's the fact. The color put on by the reporter was she was trying to convince the jury that. Now, you see the subtle difference there? Yeah, so just so deceptive. Okay, so the press is constantly manipulating things uh, with their flavor, their uh, their opinion. It's not a matter of fact like Walter Cronkite used to give it. This is a matter of opinion, and uh, they, they tend to f flavor it. Uh, trial by press. Let's go to uh, the Hootery Militia. Well, these guys were going to kill cops. That's what was presented to us, Patriot Community Outrage. These guys were going <laughs> to kill cops. They're bad. Well, I don't think that's such a bad idea. Personally... Uh, because the cops are the first line of defense for the government. 
And uh, if we've got qualms about killing co- cops, we might as well turn in our guns, quite frankly, because they'll be the first people you probably face. Uh, they might have some federal agents with them, but the cops are going to be there. They always are. They're always there. Dear shot when he got busted in uh, 1994, the cops came in with the U.S. attorney on a federal thing, our Pio's SWAT team, with the U.S. attorney. Um, Doug Carpa and Joe Valencourt got uh, busted back then, too, and the local cops came in along with the Internal Revenue Service. So the cops are going to be the front line. They're always the front line. Waco, the cops pre- uh, uh, protected the exterior perimeter. But once you got to the checkpoint, now you're uh, just, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet outside the checkpoint, you had cops. Once you got to the checkpoint, on the other side of that line was the BATF and the FBI. So the cops are the front line. So if somebody's going to kill cops, is that necessarily unpatriotic? But the stigma of that, killing cops, and so people believe what the government told the press. Sure. Same thing with the Davidians in, in Waco. The government told them lies. The press lies. The press printed those lies, so people turned against the Davidians. I was there. I talked to the Davidians, uh, the ones that were outside. I talked to those that came out. And the, the government fabrication was phenomenal. Uh, and the idea was to make it sympathetic towards the government and try the Davidians in the press and create a bad image, which most people had. Those are bad people. David Kresh believes he's God. <laughs> Stuff that was going on. That is not the truth. David felt he was in touch with God, but so does the Pope. <laughs> uh, touche. Uh, I think the, the leader of the you know Southern Baptist believes he's in touch with God. I think a lot of preachers on, on Sunday morning believe that they're in touch with God. I think there's some religious fat, fanatics that believe they're in touch with God. I think there's some Catholic priests that are a little in touch with something else, but sure, point taken. Uh, so, you know, the demonization can have an effect, even though the object of the demonization isn't that outlandish, is presented in such a way as making killing cops bad. Uh, Dorner didn't think so. Uh, yeah. or, or making somebody that does what other people do appear bad. So trial by press is where we take the view that's presented to us and we then assume that we know everything about the case. And that's where the the problem comes in. Now, does it create division in the patriot community? Yes, because somebody that's subjective and tries to get the evidence and looks where there is no evidence, looks was based upon a presentation by the press or a presentation by the government, and will not assume the factuality of that. Uh, another instance, Sandy Hook. Um, what, about a week afterwards, it came out that there was a, uh, they found a rifle. And my understanding is it was a shotgun in the trunk of Lance's car. And so people said, but the day of the shooting, the coroner or somebody said they were all shot with a rifle. Well, if the rifle's in the car, how could he have shot him with a the rifle? They must be lying. No, pay attention to detail. Does it mean there's only one rifle because they found one in the trunk? They found a rifle inside, or so they said, but there's a jump to conclusion. And then some people, especially these guess what I know mentalities, like to, to create a wedge at that point. They're the ones that came out and said there was only one gun. In fact, uh, uh, one rifle, and it was in the trunk of the car. I just got one again the other day that this one that uh, came out early that's painting this bad picture, and I can't find it right now. But uh... Well, you seem to be suggesting, if I'm hearing you right, that the Patriot community is just as susceptible to sensationalism as even the uh, mainline public is. <laughs> Can there be much doubt of it? Well, I mean, I always made the assumption, and perhaps this was faulty on my part for years, that those people who really gave the alternative media credence, either by being part of the audience or, or people actually making the media, were above all that. 
and 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 I have since found out that yeah that yeah sure some of them are, um, but then you have to consider the carnival of distractions, which is really the bane of the alternative media, really. Um, so okay, I've seen it twenty years in the Patriot community. Uh, I mean, this goes back to Art Bell, and uh, now Art Bell is more radical than Russian Glenn and, and, and Alex Jones, believe it or not. Um, but mm-hmm. he on this uh, AM radio all across the country, and Bill Cooper. These are two radio personalities from back in the past. Um, they were well recognized for being patriots. There was no doubt of their patriotism because they always talked against the government. But Art Bell was talking about the, uh, the, the tunnel that you could drive a truck through that goes from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Um, it's interesting that I guess my observation back, in fact, I heard Bill show, uh, he had a guy on that was supposed to be a BATF agent, and the BATF agent was talking about the window in the water tower, uh, which was that large tank there. Uh, there was no window in the water tower. Um, and so I sent a fax to our Bell show and said I'd like to come on, and I called, and I'd like to come on and, and ask some questions. But... I guess my name was known because he wouldn't let me come on. They told him, they know you're not allowed to come on. But if I want a radio show and I want people to listen to it, I've got to put something out that excites people. So there's a tendency, whether it's the written word or, or the AM radio back then or Internet radio now, to come out with sensationalism because that's what draws crowds. And I've got to draw crowds because my pay-per-click, you know, I need people to come there and click that or make donations to the page. And so it's kind of a a necessity if you're making a financial resource of what you're doing in the Patriot community, whether there's web page, radio, or anything else. So sensationalism, picking up the guess what I know mentality and manifesting that without looking at the detail and trying to be objective in your evaluation, uh you know, you have a you have a problem getting the, the the facts right. There's just ingrained you don't want it to be that way. Um, even even if that entails uh, just telling things that are just out and out just lies from start to finish. Yeah, as long as you, I, I suppose. You know, I, I can't sit there because I don't wear those shoes. Uh, but it seems that, yes, that you'll rationalize the existence. Absent some proof to the contrary, I'm going to accept this premise. Now, well, at that point, they're just as bad as the mainstream media because that's what they do all the time. In fact, they don't, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I could have sworn that one of the reasons the alternative media originally rose up was as a response to the mainstream media, that oligopoly of, I think it's the big six or big four now or whatever, uh, constantly lying to everybody. Well, perhaps they're worse. <laughs> Think about it. And now, you know the signature I had on my emails for a while, the conventional view serves to protect us from the painful job of thinking. And it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Instensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit the theories instead of the theories to suit the facts. I mean, the reason I put that in my signature was that very same thing. But let's look at mainstream media. They lie all the time unless they say something we want to hear. For example, there's another bomb in the Mra building. Oh, yeah. Uh, or, you know, uh, CNN did a wonderful job on the Newtown shootings, the Sandy Hook thing, because uh, I think I counted 17 different stories coming out of them, and they ended up getting the Lanza brother arrested because they tracked him down and says, this has got to be the guy, and he lives with his father, which he didn't. But they arrested Lanza's brother. But if they profess to be patriot, if they profess to be on our side, we're going to be more susceptible. We're not just going to say they're telling the truth when they say something we want to hear. We're going to assume that since they're on our side, that they're telling the truth, whatever they say. So what, it's a lowering of the guard then on the audience's part? Right. We've accepted them as part of our community. Therefore, we know they won't lie to us. And and, the, and it, I'm just flabbergasted because considering all bunches of things, such like the secret police or C3CM or any one of a number of things where there's been some measure of infiltration in some way, shape, or form, 
you'd think that the patriot community would be a lot more skeptical. <laughs> well, no, because they're on our side. Now, what does that create, though? When somebody comes out and says, hey, look, we don't have all the facts, and I think you're a little premature in your butt judgment, oh, what are you, a government agent? Oh, God, yeah, I've heard that apply to other people, and I think, I think yeah. It, this is true, and I'm, you know, they're on our side, so you must be on the other side. Yeah, it's a false dichotomy, much like the left-right paradigm itself. Yeah, you're with us, you're with, you know, you're with us, you're with the terrorists. I mean, at that point, what's the difference between the reasoning of, uh, of the one with what Bush Jr. said way back when? So, uh, you know, the, the, the trials are on, and, and the assumption that uh, what you get over mainstream media or even alternate media is the facts, the truth, and all the information you need to make a rational judgment is rather misleading. Uh, and it leads us down, unfortunately, the wrong path quite often, and it creates division in the community, which we don't need. The uh, I'm going to give you an example of the effect. Now, I can't talk about specifics about the common law court, but there was a case before it recently, and uh, this is going to be a generalization, but it's indicative of, of the problem. Uh, a filed a complaint against B. Somehow, a friend of B found out about that, and the friend of B contacted me and said, you can't let that go to the grand jury. And I said, why? Well, A is a scumbag, and if, if A wins, it would make A look good. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Yeah, what about the truth at that point? What about the truth? You fear A looking good if A exposes B? What about B? You're trying to make him look good when he's really bad? But that's the game that we play. These, these are, I hate to say it, names that are recognized by most people in the Patriot community, or at least in the militia end of the community. Uh, and these people seem to think that justice is manipulable. Yeah, and, that, and you know, if that's the case, then what the hell is the goal in terms of securing our liberties if you can't even just be honest on a very basic level? There's no point that it, it trying to exert any, tr any sort of real serious effort if you can't be at least honest ab about the malfeasance of others. That's all provable. I mean, oh my goodness. Justice has got to be predicated on truth, right? You have to determine the truth, and now we can apply justice. Right, of course. Now, justice, if truth is malleable, then so is justice, isn't it? Yeah, and it's not justice at that point. It's injustice. Right. Well, best yet, I'm paraphrasing him, the justice is best defined as the absence of injustice. And so what we're doing is creating an aura of injustice because... Uh, personally, we want these things to to be true or not true, whatever our choice is, uh, rather than being objective, pursuing my method of approaching any story. And uh, you and I had a conversation about something the other day, and I think you saw this. I said, uh, the story's not over yet. I've got to go deeper. I've got to get answers to all the questions that I can. Right. And, and, and I can't write the story until I get the answers, because I, if I do, I'm going to have to bend the facts to f fit those pieces that I've got. Uh, yeah, yeah, but if you did that, that would be equivalent to selling out. That's a good way of describing it, yes. I've never looked at it quite that way because I'm not getting money for it, but I guess it's very appropriate. I in principle, in principle, you would be selling out. And unfortunately, I'm noticing it with these folks in the Carnival of Distractions. All they do is sell out constantly. Mm -hmm. That's probably what bugs me the most is they have zero integrity. And God help you if, if, if you, meaning you as an individual, actually make a point about it, whether it's to the audience uh, of a particular uh, rock star or, or just in general to just other people who don't know the situation, then, you know, you're a government agent. My goodness, if I had a penny every time I heard that one. Yeah, well, I should be retired by now because the accusations have been 
yeah, but, you know, as far as my credibility, I, I can tell you two times I lied in, in articles that I did. Uh, once I might not have, I, I didn't have the facts, I should say. Uh, I am inclined to be, believe after talking to the person that I wrote about that I was right on that one. The other time that I lied in a story was done for the protection of the people on an Indian reservation in Connecticut that I claimed more Indians on the reservation than were actually there because we were outnumbered, or they were outnumbered significantly, and I was living with them, and I didn't like the idea of the state police coming in with guns going bang, bang. But if you, I mean, on my webpage, I've got, I don't think I have all the stories up. Uh, I intend to eventually get them all up, but if you go look at the stories like Nord Davis, uh, uh, Wickenburg, Arizona, My Kill, the Golden Hill Pagisic, the Onondaga Indians, Oklahoma City, um, Waco, and all these. The, my reporting is based on, and I don't write something until I've got enough evidence to support the premise that I present as the truth. I mean, you can never get everything, especially when the government's on the other side, because they keep secrets. They know things they won't tell us, and they like that, because that leaves us in a quandary, because we can't get the proof. So, I take as much as I can, and and if my premise fits all the facts that I have, then I can be satisfied that more than likely I've got the truth. But if any facts that I have disagree with the premise, then the premise is no good. So I can't report the story. Now, that first one I mentioned, I had some facts. But the premise, or the, some claims by some people, I should say, I, there were, there were fa- facts, uh, apparent facts, that disputed the premise. So I went ahead with the story, and as I said, eventually I talked to the person that the story was about, and his absence of denial uh, was sufficient for to convince me that I was correct in the premise that I'd made almost a year before then. Uh, the Indian Reservation, hey, I lied. I lied. Quite frankly, I lied. I did it for a reason. Uh, I don't think the state police should be surrounding Indian Reservations and pointing their guns in our direction. It's kind of a scary thought. But otherwise, all the stories I've done, if you go back and check them, even Oklahoma City, where I disagree with the majority of the Patriot community, the facts are there. I present the facts. Um, I think I talked to, with you about it before, but there was a seismograph, and everybody that was doing stories on Oklahoma City bombing either grabbed the seismograph from somebody else or contacted Mr. Brown with the, the U.S. Geological Survey in Norman, Oklahoma. Well, I contacted Mr. Brown, and I said, Mr. Brown, people are saying that you... Uh, claimed that there were two bombs. And he said, I never said there were two bombs. Man, he got upset. <laughs> and I said, uh, he said, I told them there were two events. And I asked him what an event was. And he says, that's the recording on the seismograph. And then he explained that there's a lower strata and an upper strata, and they travel at different rates. And at that distance, there's a separation. But that separation will tell them how far away the event was when it occurred. If I got two things traveling at different speeds, I take the interval between the two, I project it back at the difference of speed, and I've got the, uh, the distance to the event. And he, uh, he gave me then, he faxed me the seismograph from the uh, Oklahoma Geological Survey in Norman, Oklahoma, and he faxed me the one from the Omniplex, which was less than a mile from the Mraw building. And I said, does everybody get the Omniplex one? He said, everybody that's asked for the seismograph, I've given them both of them. Well, if that's the case, then these guys that are using the one that shows two bombs, I'm not talking to Brown now, I'm talking to you. This one that shows two bombs are facts that support my theory that there were two bombs. But if I take the Omniplex one that doesn't show these two events because there's virtually no separation in that mile between the two events, or the duration or the separation is so small that it doesn't even show, there is no second event at all, they don't want to show that. Because that fact destroys their premise that there were two bombs. Yeah, I mean, and it's not sexy. I mean, because at the end of the day, what I keep seeing over and over again 
is when something is sensationalistic uh, and and outlandish and and suggests some all sorts of malfeasance, which is even worse than what it was supposed to be or, or some such thing, it's because it's sexy. And I, I'm using that kind of you know tongue in cheek, but that's what it comes down to. You know, it's sexy if you've got multiple you know shooters at a you know mass. Uh, Ramp, you know, gun shooting rampage or something. I mean, it's sexy. It, it sells. They use a different S word, sensational. I don't think it's, right. sens- it's sensational. But that, again, let's go back to Art Bell and all these people. When you run out of material and you want to keep your audience, you've got to keep them intrigued. So you'll say, it, it, especially if I can get a guest, this uh, um, Former DHS agent, uh, former BATF agent, uh, uh, BATF agent, active BATF agent, but in all these cases, I can't give a name. Can't give a name. But I've got these people. That enhances the credibility of the presentation. So as long as I can find people, D- Dr. Phil, you know, all these programs on television, they do <laughs> thing. I read an article that was kind of interesting. There are couples that go around to all these shows selling their story. Jeez. They'll make a story and go on these shows, and the producers know it, but they got to keep the show going. they got to have somebody on Dr. Phil, so they'll grab these couples that might have been on that show before and had been on all these other weirdo shows. And they just recycle them, yeah. Cycle them because they've got to keep their listening audience up. Now, we got the same thing whether we're talking about Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, all these people. They've got to keep your attention because if you leave your... <laughs> If you leave listening to them off and go somewhere else, you won't get back to them. I had a theory in surveying in Florida. I decided that I, client retention was the most important thing because if they left me, there were 70-some other surveyors in the area, and they would go to the next one and the next one and the next one, and it would take a long time to get back around to me. So I had to retain my clients. It was very important to me. So the client was always right no matter what it was. Well, not always, but... Uh, and see, the same theory applies in, in radio shows, especially when they're competing time-wise or something like that, that uh, or you're downloading podcasts and only have so much time to listen to them, that I've got to retain my audience. Now, the way to do that is make sure that every tro- show is interesting and exciting and i got these graphics to go with it and, uh, you know, uh, whatever it takes. Create martial law in Quartzsite, Arizona, where it didn't <laughs> exist. But this gets people excited. Yeah, I mean, even even Mark Dice, of all people, has had to coin the term conspiratainment. Literally, it's a portmanteau of conspiracy and entertainment. So conspiracy, entertainment, or conspiratainment. And I think he's right on the ball. Uh, at least as a subset of the carnival, at the very least, is conspiratainment. Literally, you know... You know, such and such uh, special interest is behind everything, and next week it's a different such and such special Why don't everything. We, it is, you know. we call it fictainment. <laughs> <laughs> you got that? I think so. Fiction, entertainment? Might as well be. Well, most books published are fiction. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know... It's not so much conspiracy because people aren't always looking for a conspiracy, but they are willing to buy it if it comes from a source. So the source can be credible some of the time. I've seen some good stuff on Alex Jones. Usually it's it's the raw stuff that's good, not what he said about it. It's just the raw stuff. Well, yeah. But uh, we we focus on, and I guess you, you, you from the standpoint of a lot of people that believe that all these fa- everything's a false flag, I guess it is conspiratainment, but to me it's fictainment. <laughs> so I guess it's just where you're standing, how you, uh, your subjective nature that determines whether it's spectain or can, can well, I, well, Dice meant it more in the context of like false conspiracy stuff that's not actually uh, diabolically evil. It's just it's it's fiction is really what he was getting at. It is, but when people believe it, I guess it becomes conspiratainment, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, every yeah, everything is a false flag op, like you just said. And the unfortunate thing is, I've had to tell even some of my truther friends that look, not every 
suspiciously violent event is a false flag of his visit. Well, <laughs> the premise that everything's a false flag is which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it Alex Jones or was it belief in conspiracy? Did I did did this person believe in conspiracy because of Alex Jones, or did Alex Jones believe in conspiracy because he listened to all these people? Uh, yes, in a sense, Alex Jones then becomes. The source, the foundation for the false flag conspiracy theory, that everything's a false flag event. Or just, or just look at your garden variety Patriot rock star. At some point, it's, it's one theme I've noticed with any of them, is at some point they will proselytize, because it is, it is a type of religion, it has religious characteristics, and I mean that in the very worst sense of the term, yeah. not actual religion, but, but it'll have these kind of more cultish aspects of like, look, I said it's a false flag. That means it is. And I've seen all sorts of guys do it. Well, they even passed the collection plate, so it does emulate, doesn't it? <laughs> At least institutionalized religion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, so it, it has nothing to do with the actual content of, of, the, of the data that's being presented or, in, or analogously speaking, the actual, you know, theology. Uh, it has everything to do with the, uh, you know, the trapeze artists and the uh, <laughs> and, and the women with the mystical ball reading your future. All these carnival sideshows, the the house of horrors, where uh, where you know where something can look sinister only if you look at it from their controlled vantage point. But if you weren't looking at it from their controlled vantage point, it's not really that sinister. And even if it was legitimately bad, you could overcome it not to. Not too hard. I mean, part of what I, I mean, I like to use the example of the vaccine issue. Personally, it's like, okay, and, you know, last time I checked, Gary, there hasn't been any sort of nations in these United States. It's still voluntary last time I checked, so why worry at this point? Well, back in uh, 95, I wrote an article called Escalation and Fear, Fear and Escalation. Um, interestingly, that is probably what cost Michael Hill, militia chaplain, his life. After the Oklahoma City bombing, and this article is written as a consequence of the bombing, uh, there's a degree of fear on both sides. The Patriots feared the government because of the bombing, because they were saying the government did it, and they're trying to make the Patriots look bad. And the government's afraid because all these people died, and is this going to start the ball rolling against, say, a civil war in this country? Uh, so escalation and fear, fear and escalation is cyclic. It keeps they keep it is a keeps building itself up. It's a hamster wheel. It's like a ping pong game. What? Yeah, hamster wheel too. Yeah. Mm, yeah. We all know the hamster don't turn around. It, it go, it, this works from both sides. Now this. Uh, uh, okay. Back to the conspiracy and Alex Jones. We've got the same thing, that they, they feed themselves and they escalate. Uh, the false flag creates fear. Oh, that false flag will get to me sometime. Uh, so, uh, well, we don't escalate, but the government escalates <laughs> with legislation and all kinds of different things. So we've got but that fear and escalation, escalation and fear uh, it is a, a concept of, of self-feeding, something that uh, a fire that fuels itself, so to speak. And uh, the conspiracy theory false flag is, is a good example of that. All the false flags that are claimed, if you look, go look at all the facts that were obtainable on the subject and really weighed them, would you come to the conclusion it was a false flag or... Some guy that just <laughs> should have been in a nut house wasn't had access to a gun, got it, and uh, maybe he wanted to go out in glory, so to speak, which appears to be what happened in Columbine because these guys apparently left not manifestos but um, left evidence that they wanted a reputation out of what they did. Um, so you can't blame everything on on false flags just because it happened. 
you know, it, it's to the point that if, <laughs> well, back in the early 90s, Linda Thompson came out with the list. I, I don't think she generated it, but she promoted it, of all the people in the Clinton administration who had died. Some of them include the BATF agents that uh, got killed trying to go into Mount Carmel Center with guns blazing. But they made this big stink over making it look like uh, Clinton was getting rid of anybody that might know anything about him. Now, some of it might be valid, like that guy that died in the park in Washington, D.C., and maybe a few others, but the list was very long. And interestingly, that list just came across my email a couple a week or two ago, the same list from back then. And they claim it's a false flag, but, you know, uh, five guys were killed in a helicopter accident. Well, when a helicopter becomes a rock and falls from enough altitude, generally it kills everybody on board. And so if a helicopter goes bad, was it sabotaged? Because only three of these guys are on the list. They used to be Clinton bodyguards. And they happened, they were military, and they were only bodyguards when I looked into it then. They were bodyguards when he visited some city. They were Some of the local military were called out to be kind of a security detail. And so they weren't really bodyguards of Clinton, and they probably didn't even see Clinton. But they were involved in a security detail when he went to some event somewhere. But it became, these guys, the implication was these guys were assassinated because they were Clinton bodyguards. Yeah, of course they were. So that that's the kind of the thing that escalates, and now this damn thing is going around again. I've only seen it once recently. The last time I saw it was back in the 90s. And uh, looking to see if I can find it right now. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and that's the other thing, too, that kind of bugs me about the whole, uh, you know, oh, it must be a false flag op with whatever the it happens to be this week, is that, those guys, even if they're well intentioned, they're not applying, they're not doing what they should be doing, which is applying the Hegelian dialectic and trying to counteract the establishment solution to whatever the problem was, whether genuine or artificially contrived. Because frankly, at this point, you know, it's just, it's a scholarly distinction at most. Um, but the, but it's almost like they kind of get stuck in step one of the Hegelian dialectic and, you know, a problem reaction solution. They get so stuck on the problem with the whole false flag op thing and then they completely neglect trying to at least counter step three in the, in the, you know, establishment solution to whatever the problem is. And I, I just find that really irresponsible. I really do. You know, it doesn't move the, the you know, it doesn't move <laughs> the cause for liberty forward. It doesn't do anything constructive. In fact, I think it's masturbatory, quite frankly. Well, <laughs> very pos- possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if it did, if it, well, if all, focusing on, you know, such and such thing, whether it was a false flag or not, actually was useful, there would have been some dare shall I say, utilitarian benefit by now. But I don't see, I have never seen any evidence suggesting that going about proselytizing to people, whether the mainline public or even your run-of-the-mill political dissident, moves anything positively forward in terms of securing our liberties. In fact, if anything, I've seen all the evidence to the contrary that proselytizing about false flag operations, in fact, moves things a little bit backward, or at least keeps it stagnant. I mean, it's almost like arguing, like, how many angels are on the head of a pin at this point? Yeah. Yeah, I can't find that email. I wish I I might have deleted it just because I'm tired of saying it. But uh, at any rate, that I mean, that's, you know, it is destructive, and, and it is trial by press because uh, the press is the, is the source, whether it be mainstream media or the alternate media. If they say what we want, we assume we have all the information. Uh, there was another one today at lunch that trying to remember how she put it. These these people are idiots. They don't understand grammar. <laughs> yeah, I'll back you on that one. Uh, you know, I, I need to start writing these down. I, I watch uh, the news at breakfast and lunch when I'm eating. And then at 
dinner, I watch local news, which goes to national uh, news, uh, but it's not the CNN and the Fox that I generally watch for breakfast and lunch. And it tends to be more coherent, even though those local reporters can really blow some things grammatically sometimes, too. Uh, but the CNN and Fox both just, uh, they're, they're, they are good at these phrases like, uh, she's trying to convince the jury rather than she explained to the jury, which uh, is, quite frankly, what she did, objectively, without an opinion or evaluation of the, uh, the truthfulness of it. But they, by that subjectivity on their part, they, uh, as everything we've talked about, um, makes us feel that uh, um, Anthony, what was her name? Stacey Anthony, that was the one in Florida. Something Anthony. Susan Anthony? I think so. Okay, that was the one that everybody assumed she was guilty, except the jury. Well, oh. and then the worst part is there's outrage. Now, we have a system in this country, and I can't say the justice system works the way it's supposed to. It does not work the way now that it did 200 years ago. I know that from research because the jury isn't directed by the judge. Uh, he is there to answer questions more than anything and to make sure that it's a fair trial. But instead, he dictates to them actually a printed form with a checklist. And if this, 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 and this happened, you have to find them guilty, which what happened to... Uh, the people can judge the law and the fact, which we've got a history of from John Zinger, John uh, John Peter Zinger back before there was a country, but he was acquitted by the jury uh, for libel, e- even though the evidence showed it because they felt the law was unfound, all the way to prohibition, where people would not convict people in violation of the, what amendment was that, the 19th Amendment, prohibition? 18th Amendment? Uh, yeah, uh, Prohibition of Alcohol was 18th Amendment and later repealed by, I think it was the 23rd, if I'm, memory serves me correct. But during Prohibition, people would not convict people for transporting, possessing, consuming alcoholic beverages. They didn't consider it a crime. So as recently as the 1930s, uh, 20s, or, uh, uh, 20s or 30s, I guess. Uh, some yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, that, that we could judge the law as well as the fact. The ultimate arbiter of the, uh, determination of the validity of the law. Now, we've gone away from that, so the justice system does suck. But if we're going to accept that the premise that we've got to do it, especially in terms of an acquittal, we, as much as I don't like the verdict in O.J. Simpson, um, I have to accept it. You know, I, to that extent, I, I we have an obligation to accept the outcome on an acquittal. Maybe not on a conviction, because conviction is where the government always gets their way, but on an acquittal, where the government doesn't get their way, and we presume to know everything, uh, we have to accept that uh, Anthony case and the, the uh, uh, O.J. Simpson one, those acquittals, is, is valid. Because the whole thing is it's better to set a, send a, set a guilty man free than to a, imprison somebody who's not guilty. And under that premise, that standard, beyond reasonable doubt, those acquittals are valid whether we agree with them or not. But in the patriot community, we don't buy that shit. We know they're guilty. Yeah, of course. And I, and I find that ironic for another reason, because so much of the patriot community is filled with you know guys who claim to be constitutionalists. And usually the focus, at least I think it's a little bit ironic, uh, is on the Bill of Rights. And last time I checked, Gary, I'm pretty certain it's in, what, Fifth, Sixth Amendment or somewhere in there about speedy and public jury trials. And I find it very revealing that those in the Patriot community who really have some involvement with the alternative media, usually on the Internet, uh, how did she describe it to me that uh, before it was like the adherent, the, hold on, the adherence of A and the adherence of B, yeah, the the well, the the foundation between uh, behind the uh, or the the yeah, well, the foundation why we I established the committee of safety common law court. A's adherents believe A no matter what A say, say, says. B's adherents believe B no matter what B says. Uh, neither side wants to hear what the other side has to say, and so the common law court was set up to be C, an objective observer that would allow both sides to present their evidence. One side, A's side, when they filed a complaint against B, and then submitting 
sorting out what seemed to have merit but wasn't necessarily proven, submitting that to B for him to offer evidence uh, in opposition to what A had offered to take it out of that A's adherence and B's adherence uh, aspect. But yes, in the Patriot community, the uh, trial by press creates the adherence in the same manner. If there's Alex Jones listener and he says there was martial law in Quartzsite, Arizona, then there must have been martial law in Quartzsite, Arizona, even though uh, the mayor says there was no martial law in Quartzsite, Arizona. Uh, we've got a problem. And we don't. Yeah, and I, and I. It gets back to black and white and shades of gray. I, I, I pointed you to something that I wrote uh, uh, today on Western uh, journalism where I. I Broach the subject of a shade of gray, but most of what you read in the patriot community or anywhere else, this is either right or wrong. There are no shades of gray. It can't be part right and part wrong. It's either all wrong or all right. Well, there were shades of gray when I was a kid. <laughs> there were shades of gray. Honestly, you know, there was something between black and white, and it could be more towards the black or no more towards the white. But we we don't do that anymore. And a good example is about you today. We, you're either a racist or you're not a racist. Now, hmm. if you think that there's a difference between black people and white people, you're a racist. You're not a racialist. You're a racist. But racialist is a shade of gray. It doesn't say whites are better than black. It doesn't say blacks are better than whites. It says that they're different. But that's an untenable outcome. And the same thing... <laughs> You know, about a year ago, I was on a, a, a the, the Unrepentant Patriot, a, a discussion group, Yahoo or Google group, um, and the issue came up of Israel, and I said, I don't believe that we should give them money. And I was accused of being an anti-Semite because <laughs> there's no shades of gray. You either believe that the, Israel owns it, can tell our Congress what to do, and we need to give them all the money they ask for, or you're an anti-Semite. Yeah, besides the fact that that particular insult is intellectually dishonest to a very high degree, I love it how if you don't particularly agree with uh, quote-unquote foreign aid, which is just a manifestation of the welfare state and a couple other things, uh, you must hate, you know, quote-unquote hate a, you know, an, an ethnically or otherwise delineated demographic of people. I, I love that reasoning, or actually lack thereof. It's it's very humorous. <laughs> why do if we, it wasn't so sad. Why do we feel compelled that we've got to take A side or B side, no matter what it is? I don't know. There's a problem with that all or nothing thinking personally. I mean, it's a false dichotomy. And it's like, you must be a conservative. You must be a liberal. You must be a Democrat partisan. Or you must be a Republican partisan. It's like, you know, step off. No, I don't. There's no rule that says I have to be. I can have my, I have my own mind. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, my opinion until I gather more evidence, but right now I'm inclined to believe this. Uh, hey, that is, not, that is not an acceptable position to take. You're either with me or you're against me. Yeah, and uh, you know where where's the uh, where's the tolerance in that? Ooh, bada bing! Yes, I did point to something that's very hypocritical on their part. Yeah, and there's no sense of in, of appreciation for individuality. There's no sense of uh, having any sort of flexibility with anything. It's it's very uh, dare shall I say very totalitarian in its essence. Yeah. That's probably a good way to find it. Let's go back to what we, I, I mentioned earlier on, that this thing that you know that I'm working on right now, trying to get all the facts. Mm -hmm. How long has that been going on? That was going on since uh, November or December, right? Yeah, it's been a few months. Yeah, and still I don't have the answers, so I can't come to a conclusion. Now, we thought we had the answers at one point, so we had a conclusion, but then... We got some more information that hasn't overturned the conclusion. However, it's opened up that there might be more information that will overturn the conclusion we came to at the time. Um, this is, you know, th that's the way it is. You don't close the door. If you close the door, 
you have to be willing to admit, if you find that you're wrong, that you were wrong. And so I stuck my neck out on coming to a conclusion about a month ago on that. And for those, uh, uh, you know, you and I have talked about it because I've used it to demonstrate some things. But on the Committee of Safety uh, Common Law Forum, there's that, that uh, wall of shame. And it has to do with a guy named Mark Koenig, goes by Smiter 13. And I'm not so sure that the outcome come to by the grand jury you now I like I told you I can't tell you who the grand jurors are I'm the only name known with the common law court but they understand now those grand jurors who are revisiting this understand that they may have to I, don't, I hate to say eat crow but they may have to admit that they didn't have all the information and reconsider the decision, the conclusion they came to in that. So, retaining an open mind is probably the most important aspect because if my mind's closed and you want to tell me that there were, this happened, and I'm on the other side, you're A and I'm on A side, A did here and I'm a B here, here, if I don't want to hear what you have to say, and evaluate that and throw that in the mix to make come to my conclusion, I'm creating that black and white world. Now, when it comes, now, it gets a little confusing because when I hear it the fourth time, and I've looked into it already, and somebody says, well, this really happened. For example, the shotgun in Lanza's car. I looked into it, and I, you know, there are reports that the rifle and the gun were recovered inside, and a few days later, a report comes out a shotgun was in the trunk of the car. Well, the these people that are saying that he couldn't have used a rifle, well, it probably wasn't a shotgun because shotguns would have torn those little bodies to part, just not blood all over, but it would have, you know, obliterated those children's bodies. But we don't have any indication. Just it was a very bloody scene. But they don't want that first rifle to exist because that contradicts them. And so when people bring it to my attention, and I've already visited a few times, I guess sometimes I get a little short with them because I'm tired of hearing this bullshit over and over and over again. So I can be rather abrupt in taking the, say, the B side on that by saying, look, there was a rifle and a, a pistol the first day, and then there's a shotgun a few days later in the trunk of the car. Uh, that doesn't mean that he didn't have a rifle in there the first day. It's hard to believe that he shot that many people with the pistol. That's a lot of re 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 reloads. But also, shooting a pistol a whole bunch of times gets to your hand after a while. I've done it. You don't fire 40, 50 rounds. I don't know how many rounds he fired, but it, it wears on your hand a little bit. But anyway, the objectivity, the keeping your mind open is is very important. Uh, that if you come to a conclusion and something comes along to dispute that, now this concept I call getting off the bandwagon. The problem is we get on the bandwagon, and regardless of the evidence that might come out later, and this was very much true in Waco because of the flamethrowing tank, once people have jumped on that bandwagon, they don't want to get off. And so it's very difficult, regardless of the evidence, for them to believe that there was no flamethrowing tank in Waco. So once you have made that commitment to, I know absolutely what the truth is, you have created that black and white dichotomy that is so destructive of the patriot community. You, you close the door at that point, not accept evidence to the contrary of what you want to believe. Yeah, and I think part of that uh, closed-mindedness, too, also comes from this aspect I've seen. Now, granted, it's not as prominent at least I don't think it's as prominent as the false flag thing or any of this other uh, kind of uh, ad, uh, these other kinds of attributes. But like whenever the Patriot rock stars within the carnival give a prediction about something. So it'll be something like you have a suspiciously violent event with a you know mass shooter and you know garden variety rock star says this has all you know this just happened yesterday. And we're looking at all the stuff that's available now, and it's got all the signs of a false flag. Or alternatively, if it's more of a kind of about the uh, you know socioeconomic collapse type scenario, 
you'll have somebody say, well, the prediction is, is that by 2016, the, uh, that we're going to have hyperinflation, and then that's when the real crackdown happens, or some such thing. And I've seen this happen over and over again. And I really do think that there's this over-reliance on predictions, especially when these predictions have been proven to be wrong. Well, I can look at 30 years of that, and, you know, if all the predictions had come true, the, <laughs> you can't even imagine the state that this world would be in. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's it. But uh, when the prediction doesn't happen, most people just, most the sources of the prediction just go on with business as usual. They won't even acknowledge that it didn't happen. Um, weathermen do that. You know, <laughs> it didn't rain. Yeah. Day, like I said, I was going to. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to keep going. Economists, though, are a little bit different because they will always point out why it didn't work. It's a little more complex than weather. You know, it's not as cut and dried. Uh, they will point out why what they predicted didn't work quite often. Some economists. That's just an ex post factor justification, though. A rationalization, not justification. Sorry. Yes, ex post facto one is, rationalization. And one is irrational. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, but, uh, but in, in, uh, as far as the predictions you're talking about, there's not even a rationalization. Well, there, w- there was a rationalization. It was a good one back in the 90s. Um, the story that came out on the Facts Network was the multi-jurisdictional mass, uh, task force is moving on Catron County, New Mexico, and they're going to take over the county. This is back in the early days of the multi-jurisdictional task force, MJTF. Uh, it's changed names now, but basically it's it's... Uh, state and local and, and mixed forces on the uh, federal level, FBI, BATF, Treasury, Marshal Service, you know, who, who knows who's in the mix. They all like to work together, basically. Yes. It sounds neat and sensational. <laughs> New Mexico to take over the county. So I called the county, county to talk to the county manager, and he heard nothing about it. He hadn't even heard the rumors yet. They were just circulating via the fax network. Well, a few days later, a fax comes out and said, They've turned around. They they realized we were on to them, that we were going to meet them with force, and they decided not to make operation on Catherine in New Mexico. Damn. And I didn't know anybody that picked up his rifle to go stop them. I mean, that sounds almost like Lexington and Concord and the British coming. Nobody, though, played Lexington Green. Nobody claimed that they had gone down there to stop this task force, but the story, the rationalization when it didn't occur, quite simply was, we scared them away. Now, that's the epitome of rationalizations. Yeah, it sounds like it. That's symptomatic of, of what happens. Uh, if, if they do respond to the something not being achieved, it, it has to be absur- absurd in their rationalization of it most often. Absolutely absurd. Well, I mean, I just wish that less of the Patriot community were a bunch of news junkies. And kind of like that one podcast I did with Randy a while back, um, you know, it's it's uh, there's, there's too much of the kind of news and analysis side of it, a lot of which is bollocksed up anyway. But and then, of course, there's, you know, for lack of a better term, the problem-solving side, you know, the actual action, the moving forward of liberty. It's an assumption by people that they are capable of critical thinking regardless of the insufficiency of the ed- evidence. <laughs> yeah, really. Now, if they were to start listing both sides, the, the, the theories, or I mean the facts, both sides, put a pro and con Draw, take a piece of paper, draw a line down the center right, throw on one side, con on the other, and every time they hear something, write it on the respective side and start weighing these things and looking at them and see if they can uh, agree with each other or contradict each other. Uh, good example is back to Oklahoma City. Uh, we've got claims of two bombs based on a seismograph, but I've explained that. The other seismograph, which was closer, would have definitely shown a second explosion if there was a second explosion. Oh, let's throw that out. But let's take NBC. They said they're evacuating the building. There's another bomb. Oh, well, that's got to be true because 
well, they always lie to us, except this time they really told us the truth. They gave it away. They turned, turned against the government. They're on our side for a change. Uh, if you write these things down and look at your sources and uh, the facts, refutable or otherwise, and I think on my Oklahoma City page, I'm not sure, I think it's uh, what really happened in OKC number three is where both seismographs are shown. People saw that, and, you know, I don't know what excuses. They wouldn't leave. They still insisted there were two bombs. The one seismograph shows it. They can't explain to me why the close seismograph only had one bomb. Because the two-bomb theory, the other seismograph, is supported by NBC. So if we list the source and what they're claiming and then start laying all this out, I would say as far as how many bombs, it's irrefutable. There couldn't have been two bombs. But, Gary, it's because YouTube said so. I mean, they saw it in a documentary and uh, or something that claimed to be that on video, they hear the narrator's voice and just assume, and they see a couple of clips of uh, you know mainstream news saying that uh, you know there's multiple bombs and two bombs and all this stuff. And so yeah, I guess there was more than one bomb. It's because YouTube said so. That's why. And once they're on that bandwagon, they won't get off because they they would have to admit that they run, uh, jump to a, a premature uh, conclusion. Well, I mean, it's 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 almost uh, the reverence that's given for uh, for video as as a communications medium, definitely within the alternative media, especially. It's almost to the level of a sacrament at this point. You know, like you know the cat. You know, like and I mean, obviously, like in the Catholic faith, you've got seven sacraments, and you know, there's there's all sorts of fun details with how all that works. But the point is that it's almost like video it, documentaries or somebody even just doing something as simple as a vlog. Literally, somebody who's too lazy to record a podcast, so they just get in front of their webcam and do that. I just, uh, I mean, good Lord, it's, it's almost as if it was like the high holy sacrament of the Carnival of Distractions. It really is. Well, unfortunately, the consequence is, we pointed, I pointed out earlier, is you become a government agent if you don't go along with the majority. Uh, truth, interestingly... Uh, has a number of definitions. One I think the most interesting, which applies to the justice system, is truth is what is determined by the jury. Um, is there an absolute truth? No. Can you get close to the absolute truth? Yes, usually. Uh, however, we have adopted a, a concept of truth by majority. Yeah. And it's not by jury because the jury weighs the evidence. It's truth by majority, and that majority is... Uh, predicating their truth upon looking at only the evidence they want to look at. Yeah, and juries have to be unanimous, too. For a conviction. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's kind of a big deal. It is, but they're, weigh they're weighing both sides, and, and, and our tendency is, is to weigh, weigh only the one side. I go back to the seismograph. Nobody wanted to hear about this other seismograph. The people in any publication, back then it was Fax Network, back in the 95, 96, 97, the Internet hadn't really uh, picked up. It was just, you know, I, I didn't get on the Internet, per se, until 96, I think. But it was Fax Network. But nobody, except me, faxed out the Omniplex seismograph. Hmm. And, you know, that just... <laughs> That's a warning, people. If people have the truth, if they have evidence that something's true and it doesn't fit what they want, to, the, the truth that they want the majority to accept, they will withhold that evidence rather than bring discredit on the conclusions, the, the, the truth that they want to come to. That's not right. I mean, that, I mean, that's what the enemy rebel government and all their sycophants do. All the little statists running around supporting this war, supporting that police state action, or whatever the central bank does this week. Um, I mean, that's all sycophantic behavior of the establishment in general. And so if that's happening on our side, I mean, those individuals who do that really aren't that much better than the enemy they claim to be opposed to. Now, now are they? I go up to something we talked about in the beginning. They're probably worse. Because we're sympathetic yeah. to them, we're more inclined to, to, uh, to believe them 
then the other side, and we've kind of demonstrated the influence of the other side, is very subtle, like she's trying to convince the jury as opposed to she told the jury or testified that. Very subtle influence. The influence on our side is more outrageous. If you don't believe me, you must be a government agent. And so the, we've got, we start with the sympathy, and then we toss in that ridicule to enhance the, the magnitude of the, those sympathetic to the bullshit that we want to put out. Yeah. What was it you told me a while back, remind me, about trial by jury being unique in the Bill of Rights and that, I think it was something you said to the effect of, it's the only one in there that actually imposes an obligation on other people? Well, it is. If you look at the entire Constitution, actually it's both in the Constitution, Article 3, uh, the right to try by jury and crimes, and then uh, it's further enhanced in the, uh, I think, the Fifth Amendment. But uh, of, of all the uh, rights that are, are, are provided for in the Constitution, protected by the Constitution, the only one that brings is an imposition on other people is the, the right to a trial by jury or, or the, the requirement for a grand jury. That's the only one that requires other people to participate in the protection of your freedoms. Nothing else. Hmm. My right to keep and bear arms does not uh, affect you. My right to freedom of speech does not affect you, unless you're offended by what I say, and then in that event, tough shit, as long as I present <laughs> uh, a decent manner. Uh, all the rights enumerated in the Constitution, only the the ones that have to do with jury, grand jury or petite jury, impose on other people to sustain the right of a fair trial. And that jury is there to become that element C that I talked about when A and B are at each other's throat. C, that independent third party evaluating the evidence from both sides now it requires anywhere from six to twenty six people, depending on which state and different structures uh, that have to come together to protect your right to justice. Well, I just hope that soon the patriot community would really start getting serious in the sense that they start taking trial by jury seriously and they really get away from trial by press. Um, because I don't see any sort of, for lack of a better term, I don't see any sort of unity or much less coalition building in the sense with the, uh, the friendly factions like you've written about until such time, you know, the community gets its own stuff together. And I think, and I think if they really, really appreciated, really and truly appreciate a trial by jury and got away from trial by press, I think we'd all be better off, quite frankly. Well, uh, definitely, uh, uh, the unattainable trial by a jury. We've, you know, created the Committee of Safety Common Law Court as an interim that at least allows the evaluation. It doesn't execute people at sunrise and find people or put them in prison or anything. But uh, as much as anything, it's there to demonstrate. What happens when you have that C, that, that third value, that uh, objective value evaluating the evidence on both sides? One instance that uh, occurred probably a year ago, uh, and it had to do with the, this group called General Congress out of Washington. And, you know, my feelings on what happened on 9-1-1, uh, September 11, 2001, aren't necessarily in agreement with most of the Patriot community. Uh, and one of the guys there said, well, you're taking the government side. I said, no, I'm taking the evidence that I've found and looking at it. And, and I believe what I, what I say, I'm not taking the government side. I'm, I've looked at the evidence and I've weighed it and I've come to my conclusions. And so we talked about a trial. Now, the trial never occurred. And the reason it didn't was we're getting back to the black and white instead of shades of gray. I said, I will defend my belief of what happened on September 11. He said, so you're going to defend the government position. And he wouldn't get off of that. He wanted to make, It had to be black and white. There could be no shade of gray. I don't agree with everything the government said. Hmm. I do believe some other things. 
and I've, you know, I was ready to present the proof that I've found to support my position and lay it before the people. But if we went in with the subjective impression, guilt by association, that I was defending the government position, I wasn't going to go there because I was guilty going in because we're dealing with the patriot community and the government's always guilty. Talk about being biased, at least on his part. Right, and uh, you know, I'll tell you another one. There's a, a, a controversial movie out now, uh, Zero Dark Thirty, I think it's called, and I, I just heard some things about it on the news in the last day or two. Uh, it's being rejected for Academy Award because they suggested that information that led to the downfall of Osama bin Laden or the execution of Osama bin Laden was the result of torture or waterboarding or something like that. But I'll, but this is supposed to be the, the closure for the people for, for September 11th. It's supposed to be the whole the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, though it's admittedly fiction. Um, but one thing that they omit in that, I'm sure, Absolutely sure. And this is a piece of evidence that I think is extremely significant. I think it was 1996 that bin Laden declared war against the United States. And nobody wants to talk about bin Laden's declaration of war. For some reason, nobody wants to admit its existence, though it predates September 11th, 2001, by five years. So... They want to start with the attack against the World Trade Center. That's the foundation upon which everything is built. Anything that led up to that doesn't count. Yeah, that, that's that's really arbitrary. I mean, that that's that's just as bad as saying that you know the current uh, drug prohibition. Uh, only started because President Nixon declared a so-called war on drugs and neglecting everything that happened before then. I mean, arguably, you could even trace it back to the first opium war between the British and the Chinese, technically. Well, let's stick to this country. Let's see, in 1930s, there was a amendment to the Constitution, uh, 20s, an amendment to the Constitution outlawed alcohol. Right. And uh, after that amendment was ratified, uh, cocaine and marijuana and heroin were available, laudanum were available at the local drugstore without pres- without prescription, I might add, because the federal government had not intervened to, to go through this. A prescription then was the doctor writing down the Latin so that you could go down to the druggist and get it. There was no uh, administrative agency threatening both the doctor and the pharmacist if, if they didn't follow the rules the method of government. So if it took a constitutional amendment to outlaw alcohol and these other three elements are available at the corner drugstore or anywhere else, I guess, if somebody, a dry goods store could sell it, you know, out west where they didn't have drug stores, a dry goods st- uh, store could sell it. Um, how can they administratively outlaw these other three drugs when alcohol was uh, required a constitutional amendment? So... What we've stepped into, and we've kind of followed the government in, in that black and white attitude. All drugs are bad, and even though we couldn't get by keeping the, the prohibition in, in force, we as your government, against your wishes, will continue to protect you from yourself. Uh, they have created a black and white that most of us for our entire lives have lived with that black and white uh, acceptance of things when i was a kid duck and cover for example black and white they're gonna drop a bomb on us it's just a matter of sooner or later and when that bomb comes we want you to prepare so when the teacher says duck and cover bend over and kiss your ass i would know uh i don't know we've got to get away from black and white we've got to get back to subjectivity uh based on objectivity I mean, we've got to make our own decisions, but it's got to be based on objectivity. And objectivity is accepting the black side and the white side and evaluating and coming up with your opinion of what happened based upon both sides of the coin. And uh, that's the concept of justice in this country that we've lost sight of because we believe the judge can overrule the jury. We believe all this other stuff and that, that law is absolute. And, but at the same time, we object when they come to... Uh, a verdict that we don't agree with. 
I think that's called hypocritical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, well, thanks, Gary. I uh, I definitely appreciate your uh, your insight on this since you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. It just you know just this kind of thing bugs me. It really does. Well, it bugs me too, but uh, I'm not going to give up the position I hold, which is to gather everything I can and then come to a conclusion. But we be willing to change it if something comes along that disproves the conclusion that I came to. And I'll, one piece of evidence can be enough to discredit it. And I go back to hard evidence in this case, the seismograph from the Omniplex, there couldn't have been two bombs. Could. Well, I guess going forward, I guess probably the best thing that I can do, at least on an individual basis, is maintain my objectivity as much as possible. Well, that's probably uh, yes, and then come to your subjective conclusion because you'll never have all the information, but you cast out that which doesn't fit first. Uh, I mean, there's always a degree of subjectivity. You cannot get away from that. But starting with an objective foundation to weed out the, the, the chaff and then looking at the wheat and coming to your subjective conclusion is the proper way, the fair thing, the honest way of doing things. Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, actually, it's kind of getting late here, and, uh, <laughs> and the old family's kind of bugging me, so I guess I'll have to get off for now. But I appreciate it. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Good night. Good night.